Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to ex show you some of my experience with negative pressure ventilator over the last few years. Um, I, uh, we've heard during the course of the afternoon uh, really excellent science and excellent lectures on the, um, on the implications of patient ventilator interaction and also um, uh, the importance of lung recruitment and keeping the lung open. So it's really my job to, to show you um, a little bit of the history, uh, show you what I've been doing the last um, five years or so with some uh, uh, typical cases that we've used a negative pressure ventilator, and then to give you some insight into what I think is we're going to see in the immediate future, maybe within the next uh, few days, um, with, uh, with negative pressure ventilation. It's quite clear that you can provide non-invasive ventilation uh, by negative pressure ventilation as well as we doing very often now with positive pressure ventilation and really um, uh, some of the techniques of negative pressure ventilation are very much akin to providing CPAP, providing um, bi-level ventilatory support and providing pressure support for lung recruitment, opening the FRC and providing oxygenation. It's sobering to remember that uh, up to about 40 years ago, uh, this was the main form of negative pressure, the main form of mechanical ventilation. It's only with the advent of new technology that everybody's got very excited about intubating and putting patients on positive pressure ventilation. But um, really, the patients with negative pressure ventilations were reported, and those using it now report, that they're extremely comfortable. Some of the techniques were very unusual, but really we, we looked at uh, tank ventilators um, as the initial form of, of non-mechanical ventilators, which were driven really by bellows or, or tank systems, uh, and really were making the patients very comfortable in recruiting the alveoli, opening the FRC, and providing oxygenation. My first experience with the negative pressure ventilation was back in South Africa in the last 15 years when I got the first uh, Emerson uh, vacuum cleaner type negative pressure ventilation with a poncho jacket and found in, in cases like this particular case, which was a lady, a diabetic lady who underwent coronary artery bypass grafting and suffered bilateral phrenic nerve paralysis, and I published this at the time, of how we recruited the um, alveoli and provided negative pressure ventilation and brought time while her uh, phrenic nerve paralysis uh, recovered. Um, she was able to lie down and sleep on the negative pressure type of ventilation and during the day she could get up and walk around and because we maintained her lung function at night when she was sleeping and lying down during the day, she managed with bilateral phrenic nerve paralysis. Over the last five years, I've been using various forms of negative pressure ventilator to try and apply the same thing. Um, they come in various different uh, shapes and sizes, and the technology has actually advanced quite rapidly over the last few years, and I'm going to show you that now and show you how I apply it um, in, the, in the unit. This was a lady with uh, um, uh, bronchiectasis, severe bronchiectasis awaiting lung transplant, who we managed to keep out of respiratory failure and intubation simply by negative pressure ventilation. This tortoise cell type curash with the NEV ventilator worked very well. It was comfortable for her shape and chest and we actually kept her out of respiratory failure pending lung transplantation. One of the biggest developments and advances has been in the last few years with, with flexible cuirasses and particularly that you can see through the cuirass and watch the abdominal movement, which is not only good for monitoring, but it's also good to teach uh, the young doctors how, how it's working. And um, this, is, this is a cuirass which has been developed by uh, the pediatrician uh, Zamir Hayek, um, which is a, a much more flexible, much more comfortable cuirass, can, comes in various ranges and sizes with very soft, comfortable rubber, which is really comfortable for the patient. And we've used it in a number of patients. This is a young girl who was involved in a motor accident and unfortunately for her required, uh, got traumatically acquired um, central alveolar hyperventilation, on Dean's curse type situation. And every time she dropped off to sleep, she stopped breathing. And she initially had a tracheostomy, was ventilated, and got very unhappy that the tracheostomy was smelly and that she had to go around to school and to university with a tracheostomy and asked us to take it out. And we managed to put her onto the negative pressure ventilation, slowly monitored her, got her off um, IPPV, and now she has her tracheostomy closed. And every time she wants to sleep, and every night she puts on the caress and drops off to sleep very quickly and very comfortably. 
He has a young girl with uh, endocrinological problems with obesity hyperventilation syndrome who is somnolent all day. She can't study at school because she's drowsy and sleepy. She has a, a degree of hyperventilation and she was running into respiratory failure, needing positive pressure ventilation by nose mask initially. And she was very claustrophobic, hated the nose mask. So putting on a negative pressure ventilation and monitoring her CO2, we use uh, a nasal and oral um, sensors for continuous CO2 monitoring. We were able to control her every night, keeping her out of, out of edema, out of fluid retention, and out of respiratory failure with normal CO2s, and she was able to function effectively at school. This young kid was born with congenital alveolar hyperventilation. I'm sure many of you know in your hospitals that you have some cases that have been there for years, intubated, ventilated with uh, congenital alveolar hyperventilation. And this young boy was reaching the age of going to school and two things bothered him. One, that he wasn't like all the other boys. And secondly, that every time he tried to swim, the water started getting into his tracheostomy. Now he was sent home by the pediatricians with a tracheostomy on ventilation, his father connected him to the ventilator every night. So we did the same thing. We brought him to the pediatric ICU. We put him on the negative pressure ventilator. We monitored his pulse oximetry and capnography. And very quickly, in one night, we showed how we could wean him onto negative pressure ventilator, decannulate him, and he was quite uh, ready to go home with a negative pressure ventilator. An interesting uh, feature of this kid, though, was that he used to travel across Jerusalem in a bus from school to home every day and he would fall asleep in the bus and his father would take the manual resuscitator out of his pocket, uh, uh, an ambu bag, and put it connected to the tracheostomy and ventilate the kid till they got home and then put him onto his ventilator. So until such time as we could persuade him not to sleep on the bus on the way home from school, he had to stay on his ventilator. But we were easily in the intensive care unit with regular monitoring as we do. We could put him onto the negative pressure ventilator and show how he could be safely and easily ventilated during the night with capnography, with pulse oximetry, and he would put the machine on, take his bottle, and fall off to sleep within a couple of minutes very comfortably with the machine. We, we have developed a method of measuring the end tidal CO2 as well as giving oxygen. This is a special cannula, which is oxygen coming down one port. As you can see uh, my colleague showing you the oxygen coming here, and CO2 monitoring through the other port. And in patients who have a tendency to some l l lack of recruitment with uh, oxygenation problems, we can provide oxygenation and measure capnography at the same time. It's not really important what the actual number is, but what you can measure with the capnograph is whether the patient is needing to take SIMV type breaths in between the mechanical ventilation. And this gives you a good monitor measure of when to stop increasing the rate. And you can see for this patient, for example, the breathing rate was 36 per minute, but every second one was spontaneous. And all we need to do is increase the rate gradually as she was falling off to sleep and monitor to get an optimal rate to keep her CO2 at a reasonable level, and you could watch the trend. So the end tidal CO2 monitoring helps us to see very quickly if there's hyperventilation or hyperventilation, and the actual end tidal uh, CO2 number is not as important as the pattern. And if the patient has a good pattern with good emptying and a reasonably good um, curve, we can be pretty sure that that number is close to the end tidal respiratory point. What is more, the patient is awake and comfortable and can talk to you. And if you do want to get the end tidal CO2 point, you can simply ask the patient to breathe out, close the mouth, breathe out to the end expiratory point and pick up the end tidal CO2 measure. So with completely non-invasive monitoring, pulse oximetry and capnography, you can monitor the application of the, of the ventilation. This is a surgical case, a young girl who had um, spinal rods inserted for severe kyphoscoliosis and restrictive lung disease, who was unable to be weaned. And the surgeons called us to put the machine onto her to see if we could, we could wean her. And very quickly, within a few hours, we took over ventilation with a negative pressure were able to extubate her and maintained her on comfortable ventilation so that she could eat and talk and, and continue. Uh, this is uh, the pediatrician, Dr. Zamir Hayek, and this is his new uh, machine which we've been studying now. It's very much like a laptop computer, which is a computerized ventilation. Now, I think that, that the developers, and, and this is one of the most enthusiastic and, uh, and um, persistent developers in negative pressure ventilation, did a great disservice when they started talking about high-frequency negative pressure oscillation. And many of you will know that the machine that uh, we were using that I showed you in some of the future previous cases is actually labeled the Hayek oscillator. 
And I think that was a mistake because everybody thought that this was high frequency um, oscillation as the main mode of ventilation. And that's very far from the truth because most of the application of it is biphasic regular rate QRS negative pressure ventilation, very much like the old iron lung. And the benefit of that in weak patients, in patients with um, muscle dystrophy, in patients with atelectasis after surgery, patients with difficulty in maintaining the FRC and volume, biphasic, uh, reasonably regular rate negative pressure ventilation is very logical, it's very beneficial, it creates the, ins the negative pressure uh, around the chest, the expiration is usually passive, as it is in all ventilations, but with positive pressure on the abdomen applied by the same machine, you can provide an expiratory phase. And you can synchronize both the inspiratory phase and the expiratory phase with a ventilator. And as we heard earlier this afternoon in the speakers that were talking about patient ventilator interaction, the interaction of the ventilator, both in inspiration and in expiration is critical to patient comfort. So if you can synchronize it and the patient is comfortable with it, they accept it very quickly, they need little sedation, and they can be comfortably ventilated. In theory, the negative pressure ventilator is more physiological. It's more like what we do. And Michael Pinsky very nicely told us this morning how that if you have a patient with a hypovolemic state and you apply positive pressure ventilation, you can very quickly drop right ventricular output, you can drop cardiac pressure. And maybe um, there's a place for negative pressure ventilation in shock to hypovolemic cases, although it's something that I've never personally studied. Mm -hmm. The principle of the negative pressure is to recruit those alveoli in the bases to prevent the rapid shallow breathing pattern with dropping of the functional residual capacity that we see in most patients that go into respiratory failure and do it early like we would do with non-invasive ventilation um, with nose, nose, nose mask or face mask as we do in patients. The idea is to open the FRC and to oscillate around or ventilate biphasically around a better FRC to maintain oxygenation. And like we do with PEEP and recruitment and pushing the patient up the compliance curve, we can do that with negative pressure ventilation in a continuous way. So negative pressure oscillation at higher frequencies may be a way to deal with certain type of cases, pediatric cases and some cases requiring oxygenation. But biphasic caress ventilation can be much e more easily applied and we apply it regularly on a daily basis, weaning patients off the ventilator, extubating patients um, can be applied, recruiting the, the, the alveoli and opening the FRC. Now you can provide that with continuous negative like you would provide CPAP or, 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 or BiPAP with a continuous negative mode or, or a biphasic mode. And one of the most exciting things that we're seeing now is using the EKG uh, signal to trigger the biphasic ventilation at a rate equivalent to the heart rate to try and improve the cardiac function in, um, in certain patients. And simply what is done, now we can monitor the airway pressures within the cuirass by sampling, or one can put, if the patient has an endotracheal tube, you can put an airway monitor or, if, or an esophageal balloon and get a second trace, which you can't see here. But we can trigger the ventilatory pattern and then monitor the response to the, um, to the, uh, the ventilatory pattern at the same rate. Now, originally, um, the work done on, on the high-frequency negative pressure oscillation was using higher frequencies, and uh, that was not um, triggering it with the, with the heart rate, um, as we're starting to do now in some cases. But certainly, it, it's been well proven, it's plenty of it in the literature that you can read, that you can improve oxygenation in, in many types of patients post-surgery, um, as uh, Sidno and others showed as early as 1997, improving oxygenation, improving the cardiac index and the cardiac output, as Michael Pinsky said, you would do if you had negative pressure ventilation in patients um, after coronary artery bypass grafting. As I said, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Zamir Hayek, the, the pediatrician, did most of his initial work on cardiac cases. Um, this was work done on, uh, with uh, some other people at the Royal Brompton um, after Fontan operations in children with a higher frequency oscillation showing improvement in right ventricular output, um, very much like uh, Michael Pinsky suggested early today, one should try to do with ventilatory support. And some interesting work coming out of um, Leeds now 
is uh, the, the use of the, the negative pressure biphasic ventilation to improve the visualization rate with MRI scanning um, when you're doing, uh, looking at the cardiac function and particularly to do non-invasive um, coronary angiographic analysis rather than doing um, catheterization to monitor the coronary arteries. We can do it if you cycle the ventilation with the EKG and with the heart rate, improving cardiac output, you can stabilize the patient, give them some sedation, make them comfortable during the scanning procedure without having to intubate them, dropping their right ventricular output and, and, and further impairing their cardiac function. So the ventilator that we're studying now is this RTX type uh, uh, machine, which is um, uh, getting smaller, more compact, and more versatile. One can provide regular rates, high frequency rates, synchronized respiratory rates, or even EKG triggering. I just want to show you about the future because um, one of the problems is that if you're going to use a machine in the field, in resuscitation, in transporting, it has to be no glass screens like the laptop computer design had. It's got to be robust and it's got to be easy to apply and easy to put on. And um, one of the things we've been studying in our current environment now is looking to see whether people um, geared up for, uh, for this kind of warfare with masks on and gloves can actually apply this kind of ventilation. Because you must understand that in this situation, it's almost impossible to intubate. You can't see very clearly. Your hands are full with, with big gloves. You've got masks on. And if they can apply a very simple device onto the anterior chest wall, they may be able to save lives during the situation. Now, you've seen many pictures on the television right now of people with the face masks on uh, in the field. And we did some study looking at the um, at what happens when you put a mask like this onto your end tidal CO2 and to your breathing. And you heard earlier today how important the, the breathing was as an exercise test, as a stress test. If you put a mask on like this, you have a buildup of CO2 and your work of breathing starts to become enormous. If you're a fit, healthy marine in the field, you can actually cope with it. But if you're an elderly patient at home with a face mask on and uh, running into respiratory difficulty, we have to do something about it. So one of the applications that is being considered now is if somebody should run into trouble, getting short of breath, having to wear a mask, one could apply this. And we showed very nicely in some, in some human volunteers that we could bring the CO2 down very quickly, control it, unload the work of breathing, and the patient was comfortable on, um, on negative pressure ventilation. Also in the field, if, uh, God forbid, we have to deal with kids or, or people that are collapsed and uh, because of chemical warfare or because of, of, of something that paralyzes them, very easily and very simply, untrained personnel can clip a cuirass onto the chest wall put on, this, this, is, a, this is, a, is similar to the computerized version I showed you, which has an RS-232 port that you can plug into any computer, set the parameters for baseline, and just with an on-off switch, switch it on, and it will, it will continue to cycle in a controlled mode at a reasonable rate, like 20, 22 breaths a minute, with adequate ventilatory pattern to support a normal lung. And in theory, you could support a patient's vital lung function in a weak or paralyzed patient, at least for a period of time. This initial model has got a four-hour battery, but a simple clip-on cadmium battery can increase that to eight hours or longer period of time. So I hope we're not going to have too much experience uh, in the near future to train, but this is something you might see in the very near future in this, in this kind of application. A very small, compact method of providing biphasic, cuirass negative pressure ventilator. So we found in our intensive care unit that we can apply negative pressure, biphasic, cuirass ventilation, cycled at normal respiratory rates. We can wean patients very quickly by clipping it on while they're intubated on their positive pressure ventilation, monitoring the weaning process, monitoring the pressure support coming down and the need for, for, for less and less positive pressure support and easily extubate the patient. So the patient can be awake, cooperative, eat, talk, communicate, and it can be applied by um, a relatively untrained people. One of the biggest resources in the intensive care unit that we found that we haven't utilized properly in the past is the patient's family. And more and more, we are starting to show family members how to apply non-invasive monitoring with pulse oximetry, non-invasive monitoring with capnography, non-invasive ventilation with cuirass type ventilators and using the family as a resource for supporting the patient and perhaps sending them home early on ventilatory support. Thank you very much.